You know, uh, one of the important lessons that I see here is uh, it's okay to tell God that you don't know what to do. As far as I know, there are no super, you know, um, people that know everything. Uh, now, there, there may be people that try to act like they know everything. And, uh, <clears throat> but I don't think anybody knows everything. I think everybody comes to those times, those moments in life where you just need to, you, you need to say to God, I don't know what to do. And so that's what Solomon, that's what Solomon in uh, 1 Kings chapter 3, and I'd sure encourage you to follow along there with the Bible you have. But, uh, and by the way, did you know, did you know Solomon has the reputation of being the wisest man that ever walked the earth next to Jesus Christ, next to um, the Lord Jesus Christ. Solomon uh, had matchless wisdom. And he had that wisdom, and it's all because there came a day and a time in his life where he said to God, I don't know what to do. And so, now, a lot of times, pride will keep us from admitting the truth, you know. Now, there's a saying, maybe you've heard this saying. The saying goes, fake it until you make it. What does that mean? Well, it means, it means pretend that you know what you're doing, even though you don't know what you're doing, and hope that you don't get found out. That's what it means. There's a lot of people trying to fake it until they make it. Um, but you know what? Solomon didn't do that. Solomon did not do that. Um, now, let's... Let's just dive right in. Verse number three. I hope you're there. I hope you're looking on. First Kings chapter three and uh, verse number three. And Solomon loved the Lord. See that? Solomon loved the Lord. Well, do you know that is your purpose in life? Somebody says, why am I here? I can't even figure out why I'm on the earth. I can't even figure out what life is all about. And some would say, in fact, my life has been so difficult and hard, um, I, I'm not sure I even want to be here. Oh, well, the first thing we learn is the great purpose of your life is to love God. That is the great the greatest and highest purpose of your life. Um, in the beginning, God created. You're not here by accident. You did not slither out of the ocean and grow legs and stand upright and walk around the earth because of random chance or some cosmic explosion or some accident. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Creator God. And Solomon loved the Lord. Walking in the statutes, the commandments, of, of David, his father, only sacrificed and burnt incense in the high places. So Solomon loved the Lord, and the reason Solomon 
offered sacrifices to the Lord is because Solomon believed in the greatest sacrifice of all, the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, which taketh away the sins of the world. Now, every sacrifice that Solomon offered demonstrated that he was a believer, that he had accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as his own personal Savior. You see, why Jesus? Why accept Jesus? Well, why Jesus? Because Jesus is the one that died to pay for all of your sins against God. That's why accept Jesus, believe in Jesus. And Solomon did that. And he's offering these sacrifices as a testimony that he has accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go on. Verse number four. And uh, the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there. For that was the great high place. Now, look at this in verse number four. Well, how many offerings did he? A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer Upon that altar, a thousand, a thousand offerings. And so he's uh, giving great evidence that he believes in the Lamb of God, the greatest sacrifice of all, Jesus Christ. And he's demonstrating his faith. Now, notice in verse number 5. So, in Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And if that's what God wants to do, that's what he will do. <clears throat> and that's what God did in Solomon's life. Now, watch this. So, God sees Solomon's faith. God sees Solomon's obedience, but most important of all, by Solomon's faith and obedience, God sees that Solomon loves the Lord, and that blesses, that blesses the Lord, that blesses God. Let, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you this question. Um, have, you, have you ever not been loved you don't need to raise your hand. I don't, need to see, I don't need to see your hand. Just let God see your heart. But have you ever not been loved? Uh, see, I want, you, I, I want you to try to relate to Solomon's love for the Lord. And do you know the most painful experience any person can have is to not be loved. Do, do you understand that? There is nothing that hurts more than to be going through life not being loved. You see, God's first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. See, because God understands the pain of not being loved. So what God wants more than anything else is to be loved. And I'm going to venture to say this, and I think it's, I think this statement is right. More than anything else, every person in this room wants to be loved by someone. 
not used, not used by someone. No, no, not used. But every person in this room wants to be loved by someone. And the reason you are like that is because that's the way your creator is. That's the way God is. And, and so, um, you know, I mean, when the, when the Bible says Solomon loved the Lord, I mean, that means something. See? And God is blessed. God, I mean, here's a man that loves me. And, and I just want you to see God's response to the man that loves him. The man that because he loves him, obeys him. And the man that believes in him. And that's Solomon, you see. And I want you to look at God's response to Solomon here. Would you see it with me in verse number 5? <clears throat> look what, So look what God says to Solomon here. I think it's just... It's a, you know what, this is here for us. This is here for you. This is here for me. And this lets us into the mind of God. It lets us understand how God thinks and how he feels and how he works when he finds somebody that loves him. Now look, <laughs> have you ever felt used by somebody? Have you ever felt used by somebody? Not loved by somebody, but just used by somebody? Well, I tell you what, God is feeling loved by Solomon. Not used by Solomon, but loved by Solomon. And so in verse number 5, look what God says to Solomon <clears throat> when he comes to Solomon in his thoughts while he's asleep. Okay? Look what God says. Ask what I shall give thee. Wow. Now what would you do with an offer like that? What would you do if God were to make that offer to you? What would you ask God for? Well, God just put it out there before Solomon. Ask what I shall give thee. Well, that's just Solomon. That's, that, that only happened to Solomon. And that was thousands of years ago. I mean, God doesn't do that. I mean, that was the Old Testament. God doesn't do that in the New Testament dispensation of time. He doesn't do that in the church age. God, God doesn't do that anymore. You want to mark your place and uh, turn over to Matthew chapter 7, please. Because uh, if you think God doesn't make that offer, the offer he made to Solomon, you, you don't think God makes that offer to people nowadays? Well, then you need to see the Bible. You need to see what God's doing nowadays. Look at it. It's in Matthew chapter 7. And uh, Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 7. What's the first word from the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ in verse number 7? Yeah. Oh, you saw it. You must have the same Bible I, I have. The first words out of the mouth of God, same God that, same God that said to Solomon, ask, is ask. Ask. Well, will it do any good if I ask? According to Jesus, it'll, it'll do good. <laughs> it'll do a lot of good. Ask, and it shall be given you seek and ye shall find knock 
and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth, and he that seeketh, findeth, and to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? Verse 11. If ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your father... So we know that this is directed to believers, to children of God. And that's what Solomon was, that's what he still is. Your father which is in heaven, how much more shall your father which is in heaven give good things to them that do what? Ask him. Look at John 16. Go over there to you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, John chapter 16. John chapter 16. And look at some more words of Jesus in verse uh, the last, the last statement in verse 23, and then we're going to read verse number 24. So John 16, 23. Whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will, he will do what? He will give it you. Now look at verse 24. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be so you say God doesn't make the same offer today that he made to Solomon thousands of years uh, well God says different God says different now Solomon was obedient which proves that Solomon loved God and was a man of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's go back to uh, let's go back then to uh, what is it? First uh, Kings chapter three. And Solomon said, verse six. Now verse six. So God said, "Ask." And God says to everyone in this room, "Ask." Well, if you don't know Jesus. If first thing you need to ask is you need to ask God for his forgiveness and his salvation. That's the first thing you need to ask God for because all have sinned. We've all broken God's commandments. Every single person in this room has broken God's commandments, and God calls that sin. And the first thing you need to ask God for is His forgiveness. And the way you are given God's forgiveness is when you admit to God you've sinned against Him, and you accept Jesus Christ because Christ died to pay for your sins. And you invite Jesus to come into your life. And uh, that's the first thing you need to ask for, is God's forgiveness, God's salvation. And you get that when you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Well, Solomon did that, and now here he is. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David my father, so Solomon is, is the son of, the, of David who killed Goliath the giant in battle. Okay, Great mercy. 
according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee, and thou hast kept for him this great kindness. So we know from Solomon that David, David um, was not perfect, but we know that David had a heart for God. And uh, by the way, does it pay to obey God? Does it pay to obey God? Will any good come from obeying God in my life? Well, let's just pause there for a moment, and I want you to look at Psalm chapter 18. Would you do that, please? Does it pay to obey God? Look at Psalm chapter 18. Uh, David, a man after God's own heart, a man who had a heart for God. David writes, and this is David's testimony. This is David's um, experience with God. So Psalm 18, verse 20. And listen to what David says. Does it pay to obey God? Uh, Psalm 18, verse 20. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He recompensed me. That would be a word, blessed me and rewarded, he says. Verse 21, I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me, and I did not put away his statutes from me. I was also upright before him, and I kept myself from mine iniquity. So David was not perfect. Yes, like all the rest of us, David sinned against God, but, but David clearly has given his life back to God, rededicated his life to the glory of God, and uh, David is keeping himself from that sin against God. Verse 24, Therefore hath God recompensed, that means repaid me, blessed me, rewarded me, according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his eyesight. And remember, God sees it all. So yes, uh, Solomon has, like David, this testimony of obeying God. And so uh, David says, yes, it pays to obey God. Now we go back to 1 Kings chapter 3, please, 1 Kings chapter 3. And uh, verse number 7. Now look at this in verse number 7. <clears throat> Um, and by the way, for those of you sitting here who think this way, that God would never do anything great with me, God would never, never use me, um, you know, um, God has no special plans for my life, or for those of you, those of you sitting here thinking, well, I could never do anything for God because I wouldn't know how. Well, look at this in verse 7. Do you see it? 1 Kings 3, verse 7. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king. Solomon just says to God, as he's talking to God during this dream, Solomon says, You've made me the king instead of David, my father, because David is, is passing away. David is dying. And look what Solomon says. Now look at it. See, well, I, I guess Solomon went to king's school. I guess Solomon went to king's school. He got his diploma. He went there for, you know, four years, six years. I guess he got his master's. I guess he went for... 
I don't know, he went for 10 years, he got his doctorate, and he got grades were so good that God said, wow, Solomon, hey, I'm going to make you the king. I'm going to make you the king, Solomon, because you know it all. So you get to be king. Now look what look at the truth now. That's, that's all fiction, but now look at the truth here. Verse 7, And I am but a little what? Do you, do you realize what Solomon just said to God? Solomon says, God, you've made me king, and what do I know about being king? He says, I know as much as a little child knows about being king. You've made me king, and I'm just like a little child. See, when you think that you have to know it all for God to do something great with your life, your thinking is all wrong. Look at this. God did not choose Solomon because he knew it all. God chose Solomon because Solomon loved God. God chose Solomon because Solomon had faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. God chose Solomon because Solomon obeyed God. You see, the criteria for being used by God to do whatever God wants to do with your life is not that you be a know-it-all. The criteria is just that you know Jesus as your own personal Savior and that you're in love with Him. That's the criteria. Don't let anybody tell you that God could not ever possibly do anything great with your life because you don't have a pedigree of degrees behind your name. Solomon sure didn't. He says, my thinking is like a little child. That's okay because remember what Jesus said about little children? He used little children in Matthew chapter 18 as an example that they have faith. Children believe when nobody else will believe. You know, it's the adults that have the issues and the hang-ups and the problems. Children are tender-hearted and they're quick to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and in the Word of God. So, uh, you know what? Pray to God that we'll have the mind of a child. Because that's what, that's what endears children to God, is because they're so tender-hearted and quick to believe in the Word of God. God loves that. And that's the way Solomon is, you see. And, and, and then look at this in verse number seven. Would you look at this? Look at this from Solomon in verse number seven. I mean, God has made him the king. He's already the king, and look what Solomon says. I know not how. I know not how. Are you kidding me? You're the king, and you don't know how? What about if you're the pastor and you don't know how? I mean, would God ever call a man who has the mind of a child and doesn't know how? Would God ever call somebody like that to the pastorate? You know, the important thing is not that you know how, you know what's important? It's not that you know how, but that you know that God knows how and that you know God. Because by the way, He's the head of the church. And last time I checked, that's where the mind is, is in the head. Amen? Amen? 
You see, you don't have to know how, but you sure have to know him who does know how. And you have to love him, and you have to believe in him, and you do have to obey him as evidence that you do love him. You know, when God is looking for somebody, he never looks for a know-it-all. When God looks for somebody, he looks for somebody with the same characteristics and the same qualities as Solomon. Don't, don't, don't sit there and say, well, I, you know, I could ne- God could never use me. Look, if you know Jesus, the only thing God's waiting for would be for you to say, here am I, please use me. And the rest is up to God. So, what did Solomon do? Did he go to the king's conference? They have a big king's conference. A big council of kings where all the kings go and they, and they learn from other kings how to be king. Is that what Solomon... What, we need to see what Solomon does here. And uh, so 1 Kings 3. And, uh, you know, i, I got to read this. I, I really have to... Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. It, see, God doesn't want the church chairs filled with people that are making the excuse, God could never use me. Because I don't know enough. All that God's looking for from any of us is that we love Him, that we know Him, and that we obey Him. That's all God's looking for. Uh, but look what God says. I mean, this is just incredible to me. In uh, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise men, to, to confound uh, the wise, And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, the base things of the world, and the things which are despised. Hath God chosen, yea, things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. You know, our glory is not in the degree that hangs on the wall. Our glory is in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see... Look at this. Go back to 1 Kings. It's just so incredible to me. Um, Verse 8, and and Solomon says, uh, Thy servant is in the midst of thy people which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor, nor counted for multitude. That is a significant statement right there which thou hast chosen, thy people, which thou hast chosen. What does that mean? Thy people, which thou hast chosen. Look at Ephesians 1, please. Ephesians 1. Thy people, which thou hast chosen. Wow, that is a powerful, powerful statement. And so we'll look at uh, Ephesians chapter 1 and... uh, And just uh, verse 4 through 8 of Ephesians chapter 1. Thy people which thou hast chosen, Ephesians 1, 4, according as he hath chosen us in him, a reference to Jesus, before the foundation of the world. Did you know that God chose you before God ever created? 
the earth? You say, well, how could God do that? Because God foreknew that you would repent and that you would accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. God saw the big picture before the big picture ever happened. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And then here's another big word, having predestinated, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. The reason you're accepted by God the Heavenly Father, and the only, the only way that you're accepted by God the Heavenly Father is if you're in God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're in God the Son... Uh, when you repent and you, you admit to God you've sinned against Him and you trust and believe in Jesus Christ who died to pay for your sins and you turn from a life of rebellion against God uh, to accepting Jesus Christ by faith and uh, then you're in uh, in. Uh, Christ Jesus and you're saved you're forgiven you're saved from hell you're on the way to heaven and uh, it's all because of Jesus Christ verse 7 in whom we have redemption which is salvation through his blood uh, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace God's riches at Christ's expense that's what Solomon had, and I hope that's what you have. I hope that you're in Christ. And so, uh, look what Solomon asks God for. Because remember the offer, ask. God says ask. And look what Solomon is going to ask God for in 1 Kings 3. In 1 Kings 3 and verse number 9. And so here's Solomon's request, verse 9. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may be that I may discern, that I'm, you know, discern, know the difference between good and bad. Nowadays they're calling good bad and bad good and right wrong and wrong right. And that's what they're doing nowadays. But Solomon was uh, did not want to be confused, and so he's asking God to help him to know the to know what's good, to know what's bad. For who is able to judge this thy so great a people? So great a people, because so great a price was paid for those people. And verse number ten, and the speech pleased the Lord. Wow. You know, Solomon is asking God for wisdom. Remember, he's got the mind of a child. He doesn't know what to do. So what do you do when you don't know what to do? You ask God. You ask God. That's what you do. Don't take my word for it, but I hope you'll take God's word for it. Let me read this for you. Listen to this in James chapter 1. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But he, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed, let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. When you don't know what to do, ask God, because God always knows what to do. Ask Him and believe Him. When you ask Him, believe Him for the answer. 
And you might have to set down your smartphone long enough so you can hear him. Amen? You might just have to give your mind and your thoughts and your attention to God so he can speak to you. And you probably need to pick up his word because usually that's how God speaks to us is right out of his word. You don't know what to do? Ask him and then believe him for the answer and then listen to him. Wow. And so that's what Solomon did. You know, um, and the speech, verse 10, the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. You know, there's a lot of things Solomon could have asked God for. A lot of things he could have asked God for. But what does he ask God for? He asks God for wisdom to know the difference between good and bad. Why would Solomon ask God for wisdom? Because Solomon wanted his life to count for God's work and God's service and God's honor and God's glory because he gave his life to God. And he just wanted to live for the glory of God. And that's why he asked what he asked in this prayer. Verse uh, 11. And God said, unto, now look at this, we're just about there, but you got to see this. And God said unto him, because thou hast asked this thing for wisdom, and, and, and hast, hast not asked, now here's a list of things that Solomon did not ask for, he could have asked, but he did not ask for a long life. I mean, you know, everybody wants to live a longer life. You know, uh, why am I going to the doctor? Why am I going to have this surgery? Why am I going to have this radiation? Why am I going to, you know, uh, have this uh, surgeon, this physician do this? To my body. Why? Because everybody wants to live longer. Uh, nobody wants to die sooner. Everybody wants. Uh, nobody wants to die even later. And but, but Solomon doesn't ask God for a longer life. He he asks God to equip him so that his life could be useful to God. For the glory of God. What a, what a selfless, what a, an, an unselfish prayer request from this man who has the mind of a child and who doesn't know what to do. Neither hast thou asked riches for thyself. I, are you kidding me? He could have asked God for riches, but he doesn't ask God for riches. I mean, does anybody want more money? Would anybody like to have more money? Would anybody, would anybody want to be richer? Right? Yeah. See, but he doesn't ask God for riches. And, and then what else doesn't he ask God for? Uh, let's see, something else. Um, Nor hast asked the life of thine enemies. Solomon had enemies. But nowhere in his prayer does he said God does he pray God I wish that you would I wish you would kill him or kill her or kill them because of what they've done to me because of how they've injured me because of how they hurt me because of what they have uh, stolen from me you know, I, I just God I wish you'd just kill them. Now, so, I want, you, I want you to see something. Just one verse in 1 John 2, 27. You need to see this. 1 John 2, 27. You know, preacher, I can't afford to go to Bible college. Preacher, I can't afford to go to any college. Preacher, I, I can't go to, I mean... 
I can't afford anything. Well, I guess God can't use me. Well, putting all that aside, do you think you could just ask God? Do you think you could do that? When you don't know what to do, when you don't know how to do something, do you think you could just ask God? Could you do that? What's that going to cost you just to ask a God? What's that going to cost you? You see, I don't have, have $30,000 to pay for, uh, you know, $40,000, $50,000 to pay for a semester of college. I, you know, well, could you afford just to ask God? Just to ask God the way Solomon was asking God? As far as I know, it's not going to cost you anything to ask God because the price has already been paid by Jesus Christ. One of the great blessings that Jesus bought you, purchased you, when he died on the cross for you, is the, uh, the, uh, the right to go to God in prayer and to ask him, all paid for by Jesus Christ, who says, ask, he says, ask, and you shall receive. What? I mean, you know, do you realize how many blessings God has that are just laying there untapped and unused? Why? You have not because you, can you finish the verse? You have not because you, you ask not. I mean, it's all there. It's all there waiting for you, purchased for you by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. I mean, whatever you legitimately need, whatever you honestly need, uh, it's there. You know, look at this. 1 John 2 and uh, verse, I think it's verse 27. Yeah. Now look at this. You, you watch this. 1 John 2 and verse 27. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, in you. And ye need not that any man teach you. Ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. You see, when you accepted Jesus, you were gifted God the Holy Spirit who resides in your soul. And he is there to guide you. He is there to lead you. He is there to help you. He is there to comfort you. He is there uh, to give you the wisdom of God, the guidance of God, the help of God. In fact, he is the parakletos of God. He is the one called alongside to help. He is our helper. You know, what do you do in life when you don't know what to do. Solomon gives us the right example. You just go to God and like Solomon, you say, God, I don't know what to do about this. I don't know how to deal with this. I don't know what to do about this. But God, you want me to ask you and you want me to believe you for the answer. And so, um, verse 13, verse 13 of uh, 1 Kings chapter 3, verse number 13. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked. Can you believe that? I mean, he asked for wisdom... So that 
his life would serve God well. And God says, I'm going to give you riches. I'm going to give you riches and honor uh, so that there shall not be any, he says, uh, among the kings like unto all unto thee all thy days. So what did Solomon do? What did Solomon do? Well, let's, let's close with this in Matthew chapter 6. Here's what, you know, I mean, does, in, does anybody want to follow Solomon's example anymore? Does anybody, does anybody want to do what Solomon did and seek the Lord? That's what Solomon did. He sought the Lord. He went to God. And does anybody want to do that anymore? I mean, there's all kinds of people that are meeting with all kinds of roadblocks in life. I mean, nothing's working out. Nothing's going right. Everything's going wrong. Nothing's getting better. Everything's getting worse. Not for Solomon. It just got as good as life can get for Solomon. And look what Solomon did in Matthew chapter 6. Here's what he did. Matthew chapter 6 and uh, and verse 31, take therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles, that's another word for lost people, people that have rejected Jesus, people that hate Jesus, people that don't want Jesus. Here they're called Gentiles. For all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. What things? Food, drink, clothing, the, the needs of your life. Now look what Solomon did, and this is what we all should be doing. Verse 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And what is God's promise? And how many of these things, food, clothing, drink, all of the needs of your life, how many of those things will be added to you? How many of them? All of them! All of them! You know, see, for most people, God is the last person they think about. He's an afterthought. Not for Solomon. For Solomon, when he did not know what to do, he went to God. And he sought God first, and he put God first, and he kept God first. And what did God do for Solomon? He opened the windows of heaven and he poured out an incredible blessing upon Solomon. 1 Kings 10. You want to read about what happened to Solomon? Read 1 Kings 10. Be a good afternoon read from the Bible. It's incredible what God did for Solomon. And it's all recorded in 1 Kings chapter 10. But what are you doing? Look, David was a teenager when God used David. Joseph was a teenager when God used Joseph. Daniel was a teenager when God used Joseph, when God used Daniel. I mean, the Bible is filled with true accounts of kids that God used because they went to God like Solomon and they said, God, I'm just a kid. I don't know what to do. Please help me. And God did. What are you doing when you don't know what to do? What are you doing? Say, did you, did you ever just go to God with it? 
And then just let God work it out. Amen? Just let God work it out. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, and as we come to this invitation of God, is there anyone here that would say, Preacher, I'd sure like somebody to show me from the Bible how, to, how I could go to heaven, because, Preacher, I sure don't want to go to hell. You know, the Bible says we've all sinned against God. Those sins have to be paid for, and there's only one or two people can pay for those sins, Jesus or you? And if you'd like somebody to show you from the Bible how to be sure of heaven, how to be saved from hell, how to be forgiven of all your sins against God, and if you'd like to be shown from the Bible how to have the same blessings on your life that Solomon had on his life, I'd be glad for you to come up to me and say, Pastor, please show me. I'd like to have the blessings that Solomon had on his life. Please show me. I'd like to become a child of God. Father, bless your word, and God, we pray you'll help us by your word to follow this incredible example of Solomon at this time in his life. God, I especially pray for those who do not know Jesus, they've never accepted Jesus, they've never, they've never repented, they've never owned up, admitted to God that they've sinned against you. I'm especially praying that you'll draw them, Father. You're the one that draws them to Christ. You're the only one that can do that. And then, God, I pray for any believer, any child of God here that's in a situation where they don't know what to do, would you help them to follow Solomon's example as well? In Jesus' name we pray.